Hi, and thanks for coming out on a Saturday. Um, my name is Paul Montagna, and I am uh, endowed chair at the Heart Research Institute here on campus. I'm also a professor in the Physical and Environmental Science Department. And uh, I guess the main reason I'm here today, though, is I am co-editor-in-chief of a journal named Estuaries and Coasts. And um, because of that, I guess all of these things, I know an awful lot about how to do this. <laughs> I've had, uh, as you can see, I'm old, I'm pretty much getting toward the end of my career. But at this point, geez, I've done a lot of stuff. And when you do a lot of stuff, you just get a lot of experience and you see a lot of things uh, and, and that enables you to, um, and you, you can build on that experience and it the most amazing thing, and this is what I didn't know, I had no idea how easy this was going to get. When I was young, getting my stuff ready for publication was the hardest thing in the world. And in fact, I actually decided not to go on for a PhD after my master's because my master's experience was so disheartening. <laughs> but I, I, I kind of got lucky because I got a job as a research assistant. And when I was a research assistant, um, I discovered that you could take one course for free every single semester. I was at Oregon State University at the time. And so I decided to take an English course. Because one of the things I discovered during my master's degree was I really couldn't read and write. You know, I, I, I could pass school, but I wasn't really a functional literate. It was just a real struggle for me uh, to, to write. In fact, it was a struggle to even read a lot. You know, I'll never forget the first day of graduate school and they started giving out these 100-page reading assignments. I thought it was a joke. I didn't, I didn't know people read that much. Because to that point, I think I had read only one novel in my whole life. I never read a novel in high school, and I only read one in freshman composition, and that was it. So even though I did pretty well in college, I was totally unprepared to, for the literate world, per se. And uh, I'll tell you, that, that experience, though, of kind of diving into, into language was incredibly useful to me later on, as you might imagine. And anyway, uh, fast forward to today. Um, I've had about 20 doctoral students, something like 60 or 70 master students, and about 23 postdoctoral researchers working with me over the years. And so, as you might imagine, that has generated a lot of stuff and something like 250 publications. So I, I've done this quite a bit. The ironic thing about the journal, uh, this journal used to just be called Estuaries. Um, so th this is actually co-published by a scientific society named um, the Coastal Western Research Federation and Springer. And back in, I think it was about 2000, uh, so I was always heavily involved in this scientific society. And back in the day, it was published by a small organization in Kansas called Allen Press. I doubt if they're even alive anymore. Um, but it got to the point, it was really interesting. Over time, and I had been on the, uh, the surfboard Coastal Western Research Federation, SURF. <laughs> I've been on the SURF board for about, for, for many different times. And that, during the entire 90s, what we discovered was we went from about 1,000 subscriptions and we down to about 500. Libraries were dropping us left and right. And the reason was the internet revolution and the revolution in publishing that's going on that plays a big role in what you're going to have to deal with over the next few years. And I've got slides about that later. But SURF realized for the journal to survive, we had to do something different. And we had to have an online publication. We were just publishing a hard copy at the time. you know, And it was costing us about $300,000 a year as a society to publish that, you know, probably about this much stuff <laughs> uh, on a shelf. And so we had a, a publications committee 
put out request for proposals, RFPs, to various publishers for a co-publishing agreement. And what we were looking for was primarily uh, an online presence and wider distribution. Make a long story short, we chose Springer, which is one of the biggest, one of the big five, by the way. I'll talk about that later too. And here is the amazing thing. Springer not only took over all of our publication for free, meaning both the print and an online presence, they actually gave us a $100,000 a year royalty <laughs> for the publication rights. So that, that was like a net you know, $400,000 change in our society budget overnight. Here's the other amazing thing. We went from about 500 subscriptions to 5,000 overnight because they were distributing to 5,000 libraries across the world and they just put us in their portfolio. And that's the real lesson about publishing today. Publishing is controlled by about five big houses worldwide and it's been consolidating. There used to be thousands of publishers, but it's consolidating and it's consolidating, and I'm talking about academic publishing primarily. It's consolidating because you have gotta have an online presence. You have to have really good online delivery and you have to have these license agreements with the people who can afford to pay for it, meaning primarily uh, government organizations or libraries or university academic libraries and things like that. So anyway, it never occurred to me at the time that I would ever become the editor of the journal, but here we are. So what I'd like to do now that I've introduced myself, uh, if you don't mind, I'd like to go around the room, just tell me your name and what degree program you're in. And I know you, but yeah. who's everybody, who, tell everyone else who you are. Uh, I'm, I'm Hao Yu. I'm a PhD student of CMSSS. And I'm studying machine, machine release from critical area to the atmosphere and its influence to the climate change. Yeah, and CMSSS is Coastal Marine System Science, in case you don't know that. And hi, who are you? Hi, I'm Liesl Strauss. I'm in the PhD program in Counselor Education. Counselor Education. Hi, I'm Diana Simpson. I'm in the Master of Clinical Psychology program. Okay. I am Emily Dominguez. I'm also in the Master's of Clinical Psychology program. Shelly Dominguez, Curriculum and Instruction PhD program. Okay, great. And I know you too. Michaela Ziegler, Master's in Neurobiology. Good. So I'm going to apologize to you from education and the non-science groups. I don't really know a lot about that world. But what I do know is that uh, because of this consolidation issue, the, you know, for example, Springer has a huge portfolio of social science and education journals. <laughs> and I also know that all the same rules apply to every one of them as they apply to our science journals. So probably about 95% of what I'm saying is equally true for you as well. Particularly if you have to deal with the peer review world, which is what I'm really gonna talk about. But if you ever have any questions or comments or, or concerns about how does what you're looking at translate into what I told you, send me an email and I will answer that question. I'll go look it up for you. Um, or or you can, we can make an appointment, you can stop by, I'll be glad to look at anything. One of the amazing thing, again, this is just a function of being old. I can look at something and in five minutes know whether it'll work or not. <laughs> it's just, and again, I had no idea this was gonna happen because this was so darn hard when I started out. <laughs> but it, it all kind of came to, um, um, I, I, what's the right word? Uh, it, it all kind of gelled and came together in my brain about um, 10, 15 years ago. You know, all of a sudden it just got easy one night. You know, it's like overnight. So my point is, it's exactly like athletics. No one becomes a great baseball player or basketball player if they don't practice and work out. And believe it or not, the act, just doing these activities every single day is what you need to do to learn how to do it. <laughs> you just, just do it, you know, the old Nike thing. So I'm gonna probably not really get through all this as quickly as, as possible. I know for sure I won't really be able to cover this. This actually is a whole one hour lecture by itself. <laughs> and I also deleted about a whole nother section. 
but uh, there's more. But I'm going to try and get through all of the main things of how do I do this? What is this world? Well, one of the things I always like to do is I like to have my, my little, uh, this is a Paul cork. I have my threes and fives of things. And so, you know, why, why is this important? And I like to call it the five C's. Uh, completeness, competence, courage, competitiveness, and your CV. And this is incredibly important, actually. As a professor who writes letters of recommendations for students, the first thing I ask them to do when they ask me to write a letter of recommendation is send me your CV, or resume, whatever you want to call it. I'm obviously, I'm using the word CV because I want to keep it to be a C. <laughs> but um, <clears throat> What are employers looking for? What they're looking for is some indicator that you're actually going to do something. You're not going to just sit around and do nothing in your life. And, that, and that's, that's where this completeness thing is. Well, no, that's where the, um, uh, I guess, the competence thing is answered. You know, but They want to know that you can actually take on a job and finish it. And being able to get something all the way through the publication stage is an indicator of that. Uh, the completeness thing is really important to me. I've got a whole other slide about this. And I think it's more about personal satisfaction. You just know that it's done. And you know, I, I find it such a shame uh, how many of my master's students in particular, and even one or two of my doctoral students, believe it or not, have never published a thing out of their work, which means it doesn't exist. You know, it's like it was never done. And how could you devote two to five years of your life to something and it's like it never happened? I don't know about you, but I would just feel bad. <laughs> you know? uh, courage. You'd be surprised how important courage is. One of the most and hardest thing in the world for a future employer to judge about you is your maturity. You know, the the most important thing in the work environment is can you deal with constructive, constructive criticism? The moment I have a student walk in my office and say, oh, Professor XY doesn't like me. He doesn't like you? What do you mean he doesn't like you? Well, you know, he, he didn't give me a good grade or he said I didn't do well on this or this or that. And that's a big red flag to me. That shows me this is an immature person. He doesn't care about you at all. <laughs> His job is to provide constructive criticism, and you don't take it personally. You know, it's almost as like you know. Imagine you know a baseball player. What is a really successful baseball player's batting average? It's like 300. Well, what does that mean? He failed 70 percent of the time, <laughs> right? But every time you strike out, you don't go, oh, the pitcher didn't like me, <laughs> or the umpire didn't like me. No, you come back tomorrow, and you get in the batting cage, and you work a little harder. And that's one of the things to really learn in life is that when you don't do well, it's not because someone doesn't like you. It, it just means you need to work a little harder on it. You need to work on your skill, hone your, hone your skills, you know? And, and that's what this is really all about. And if an employer can see that this is probably the most important thing people are looking for in prospective employees. And it's that, that maturity. <laughs> you have the maturity to be able to deal with criticism and prove yourself. That means you're going to be a valuable employee no matter what the positions are. Finally, competitiveness I think is really important because there are limited resources out there in the world. And trust me, one of the most competitive resources on earth is journal space. <laughs> and, and you literally have to fight for it. You gotta put yourself out there, you gotta fight for it, you've gotta run this gauntlet. And as you'll see, it's a pretty daunting gauntlet. And finally, you, you need to show people you've actually done something in your life, but you wanna know something? I was thinking about this on the way over here today. That's not the real reason I like to publish. <laughs> None of that is. The real reason is it just, it just makes me feel good. <laughs> you know, I, I don't want to sound morbid, but let's face it, we all have a finite time on Earth. And I, I kind of really want my life to have mattered. 
And just think, you know, everyone knows about Shakespeare, Galileo, Copernicus. Why? Because they wrote stuff. And the stuff they wrote still exists today. So things you write and get out, in, out there on the library shelves and today, of course, online, it's going to live forever. You know, it literally gives you a little sense of more immortality. <laughs> and the other thing is that it just gives you a sense of accomplishment. It makes me feel good. You know, I feel this, after I look at a published product, I feel the same way as if I just run a marathon or climbed a mountain. I mean, I just, it just feels good, <laughs> you know? It's fun. And, you know, you can't, just like running a marathon, you kind of forget the pain at the end when you cross the finish line. <laughs> and trust me, there's, there will be pain. <laughs> but again, this is all part of that process of having that maturity, competitiveness, and ability to just get stuff done. And frankly, this is the real reason I do it. It just makes me feel good, you know? <laughs> and the fact that all those other things accrue from it, that's just gravy. Anyway, let's start getting down to business. I don't want to discourage you, but it is really, really hard. <laughs> and it has gotten so much harder since I was in your shoes. I just can't get over how much more difficult it is to, to get stuff published today. And the ironic thing is the whole, um, a big part of why it's so much harder today is because of the online publication stuff. And um, it's also because of the competitive nature of the business. I mean, you're basically entering a business. When you become an author, you become both a consumer and producer in a specific business. And just like all the real businesses in the world, it's a competitive marketplace. And you gotta fight for it. And it takes a lot of preparation. You gotta find the right journal. If you don't find the right venue, it's never gonna work. You've got to understand what those guys want, the publishers, the editors, reviewers, and you've got to be organized. And it'll probably be many, 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 many files. <laughs> it won't be just one file. And the other thing that is just stunning is just all the darn clicking. <laughs> you have to do to navigate these websites. Like I said, there's about five major publishing houses today which means there are five editorial suites of software you got to learn because they'll be the same for all of the journals in their stable. Um, so, you know, it doesn't matter with if I go to Estuaries and Coast or Biogeochemistry or um, what's another Springer journal? Uh, I think Marine Biology. Uh, the, the website's identical. You go to Editorial Manager. And the same thing is true with the other big guys. But I, I just recently did one with... Um, um, Limnology and Oceanography, which I can't even remember who publishes that now. Uh, I think it, it might be the Taylor and Francis group or something. It took me three full days to get all my files uploaded. <laughs> and I'm good at this. <laughs> so it's a challenge. And I, when I do my editorial work, I'll notice the start date and the final submission date. And a lot of people can take one to two weeks to do this. So it, it's a gauntlet. And believe it or not, that was never true before. That's, that's all new. <laughs> you know, when I first started, I actually probably submitted my first couple of manuscripts from typewritten notes. We're talking the early 70s here. <laughs> and um, you, know, you just put it, put it in the mail. You put five copies of it in the mail, and you're, it came back to you eventually. And it's much harder today. But I'm going to tell you some tricks about it. Here's step one. Go get yourself an ORCID ID. If you, look, if you go to one of the typical um, uh, indexing websites and type in P. Montagna, you'll think that I have published 5,500 papers. I have not. <laughs> the web world can't tell a difference from Paolo Montagna, who is a neuroscientist in Italy, and Paul Montagna, who's a marine biologist in Texas. They can't do that. So there's been, and, and I don't remember exactly how old ORCID is. It's pretty new. And I also know it's run by one of the big publishers, and I can't remember which one. 
They actually keep it hidden there on their website. I tried finding that today. But uh, ORCID IDs are super important. Go get yourself one before you start trying to publish. Because every single publisher will require, the first step will be type in your ORCID ID. That'll be step one. <laughs> okay, so go get one. And it uniquely identifies you. This is a social media website for authors. It'll help you keep track of everything you ever do for the rest of your life. And it'll connect you directly with publishers and other authors. And the most important thing, it'll assign you a unique ID. And as I just pointed out, just P. Montagna is not unique enough. Okay? And, you know, you do all this stuff. No worries, right? Here's mine. So my ORCID ID is that number up there. And every single ORCID ID, you add this in front of it. And it goes directly to a website that ORCID has created for you. And again, this is all free. So it's kind of like Facebook for authors, right? Or something like that. And I've added stuff. Here's the amazing thing. Look how many ORCID users there are. Essentially 4.6 million. <laughs> this is a big deal, guys. This is something we need to, you need to be a part of. And, you know, it'll ask you for a whole bunch of stuff. I've also added a couple of other things, like my Mendeley profile. I'll get to that in a minute. I know that's Elsevier. And, you know, you add a few things. And one of the interesting things is how this information gets used by publishers. Once they have your number, they can quickly find everything you've ever done that has a digital footprint in the history of the world. And because so much of the old stuff has been put online retroactively, it's not like, you know, even things I've written in the 70s, you can find electronically today. It's either been scanned or republished as an electronic thing. And they'll give you scores. You may have heard of the H score or the G score. This is essentially an authorship impact score. And when uh, people are looking, you know, at, you know, looking at you as a potential reviewer, potential editor, potential author, they'll look at the score. And now, as an editor, I constantly am getting things from, the, from Springer that says, this guy would like to submit a paper. He has an authorship score of 15. <laughs> that tells me I can take him seriously. <laughs> so there are all kinds of shorthand that's going on behind the scenes that you're not aware of. And that's why it's important to do this. I'm always stunned when I run across professors who don't have an ORCID account. It's like, man, get with the program. It'd be like a... 16-year-old without a Facebook account, I guess, or whatever it is people use these days. Yeah. And so, like, we created a Word WordPress website for yes. ourselves, like a service, and a CV, place for our CV, and so we could link that to our website. Yes. Yeah, in fact, what I do now for my, um, for my web presence is I literally just list my Mendeley and ResearchGate sites, and that's got, like, my full CVs on them, and I didn't do a thing to create them. They're just literally using these you know, bots and crawlers to find anything about you on the web. And they pull it all in. And because of your ORCID ID, they know that, oh, that really does belong to Paul. Every once in a while, these kinds of sites send me an email saying, uh, you know, we found something, but we're not sure about it because there's no ORCID ID attached to it. Is this yours? And you click yes or no. We use all the time. Uh, and you know what, I'll, I'll, I'll make sure that a copy of all this can be sent to you so that you can just get all these websites. Uh, a big one today is Google. And I would anticipate this has the potential to grow immensely. Uh, these are, this is independent as well. This is run by a publisher. I'm not sure who Academia is run by. This is probably my least favorite for a lot of reasons. They're all, you know, it's one of the horrible things about social media is until one of them kind of wins the war, you kind of kind of play in a lot of them. But again, if, if you got an ORCID thing, all of these will work off that. So if you have an ORCID thing, you're all fine. All right. Ironically, next week, <laughs> Ed Warga, who works here in the library, is going to give a whole lecture just on this topic. <laughs> so I'll give Ed a plug. <laughs> uh, you know, he, it, it, this was very ironic when I found this just as I was preparing my lecture notes for you today. <laughs> so 
So that's uh, right here next week. Um, here is a new problem, and that is avoiding predatory journals. Since the world changed from hard copy stuff to online, one of the first things that happened was publication charges evolved into open access fees. And so in the old, old days, hi, I'm Paul. In the old, old days, come on in, sit down if you want. When people used to um, just publish hard copies of things, uh, there was very often literally page charges, you know, 25, 30, 50 dollars a page. The average paper ran about 10 pages, so, you know, three, four hundred dollars, and, you know, that would literally pay for the printing costs, printing and distribution costs. When online access first came on, there was this nasty detail, and that is um, nasty detail for the publishers. There was no way in heck those kind of numbers were going to cover complete free access for all eternity. Because the good thing about printed copies is, you know, like even within a department, 10 or 15 people might have to buy a hard copy. <laughs> Today, all you need is one license and, you know, all 12,000 students at A&M Corpus can see that article now for free. <laughs> so typically when Typically, these open access fees run about 2,500 bucks. So all of the big journals today will either publish your paper completely for free, they won't charge you anything. Everyone has done away with paid charges, but they will charge you an open access fee. And if you want your stuff available right away, you gotta pay that fee. They usually run between about 1,500 to $2,500. And that makes your stuff instantly unlocked and online so everyone in the world can see it immediately. Typically, all journals have an embargoed time. The most generous ones are only a year, but that's pretty rare today. <laughs> a lot of them are three, four, five years. And after that, everything you've done is completely open. And, you know, I, I seldom pay the open access fees, to tell you the truth. I do it only with stuff that I feel has to be rapidly available to everyone in the world tomorrow. And I also have budgeted for it in my projects. <laughs> so I never pay it out of my pocket, obviously. I, you know, who's paying these out open access fees are the agencies funding your research. Um, sometimes your departments will have a budget for this. It certainly benefits a university and a college to be able to get your work out on the open right away. And that's why a lot of colleges have a budget for that. I don't know if we have those here or not, to be honest with you. Um, sometimes you can apply for a small grant, too, just to get it. And sometimes the publishers will waive the fees or give you a deuce weight if you whine. <laughs> to be blunt, <laughs> you just got to ask. You'd be surprised that if you just ask sometimes, stuff will happen. I've had several faculty members tell me, uh, here on campus, faculty members here, you know, gosh, I really wanted to publish this in PLOS One, and it was like $2,500, and so I just, you know, after the paper got accepted, I just whined. I just sent them a matter and said, oh, I'm poor, I can't afford it. And they said, okay, give me 300 <laughs> So sometimes just ask, you know, what can I tell you? Anyway, there are a lot of people have been, so as you can imagine, because it's important to publish and because you can charge a lot of money for it, that has created an opportunity for predators. <laughs> Just like all phishing and other internet scams, there are publishing scams where your stuff's not really getting published at all. They're just taking your money. And as you can imagine, what do these guys do? They tell you, oh, we'll publish it for $1,000. You know, just send it. Well, we, we, we want it. You know, we'll, we'll, you know we're, we're wonderful. and We're much less than expensive. Well, you, you're really doing the exact same thing with any phishing scam. 
you're sending your money down a black hole and your stuff will actually never be really published. And so there are several lists of what we call a list of predatory journals um, out there. And so just for fun, I decided to collect all the phishing scams I got in just five days from mo last Monday to yesterday. And I got six. <laughs> I had six phishing enticements in just one week, <laughs> in just five days rather. That's more than one a day if you think about it. And so this is one of the first, and so you know, the first one, I, I got this one. Look at this one. So I'm a marine biologist, yet the Journal of Epigenetic Diagnosis and Therapy says, Paul, for only $600 and a free copy, we'll publish your papers. I mean, <laughs> if this doesn't smell phishing scam, you, 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 you need a lesson in the world world today. And then I got another one from, uh, actually, environmental monitoring and assessment sounds pretty real because, um, you know, that's exactly the field I publish in. But, you know, I, and I hate to sound prejudiced, I say things like Croatia and I start getting nervous. <laughs> I would definitely want to look into this a bit more. And then I got another one from... So here's, here's the name of an article I recently co-authored. And this is the other thing these guys are doing. So what they're doing is they're creating uh, these little, um, they call them web crawlers. They go through and pull out the titles and the names of authors for papers. And they just spam every one of them to try and get you to send them money. They're really just asking you to send them money. But this is a real common one. And, you know, it comes from the, the publishing company called SIFT. I guess that means I'm trying to sift money out of the Internet. <laughs> I'm sure there's significance to the name. And here's another one I got this week from another one that sounds real because, you know, it's the SF Journal of Environmental and Earth Science. And, again, that's the field I work in. Uh, and, you know, they're all open access. And just send us 300 words, and we'll guarantee publication if you send. It doesn't tell you this there, but when you follow the links, it's, oh, by the way, give me your credit card. And this is from some, uh, this is from Virginia, Centerville, Virginia. And here's the next one I got, which was um, biomarkers and application. Again, piece of cake. I don't do any biotechnology work. So clearly just a scammer. And then here's, a, here's a, the one that probably came in la yesterday. And again, environmental pollution, this is an area I work in. So, uh, and, and that's the other thing that you see. What should smell fishing to you is we got a deadline. Get to us right away. I mean, this should sound very familiar to you. They're just fishing schemes. All right. So how do you choose a journal? First of all, one that didn't solicit you. I can guarantee you, just, just like um, your bank is always sending you emails saying, we never send you emails, so don't click on any links that say they're from us. <laughs> and AT&T sends those kinds of emails. Uh, just about every reputable vendor in the world will send you emails telling you, I don't send you emails, don't click on links that say it's from me, <laughs> okay? So if, if you're being solicited, at least be wary to begin, at the beginning. Uh, they'll tell you it's free. When it's not, they're going to charge you the open access fee. It'll be reduced. But you can do things like look at impact factors. Not only impact factors, but the indexing. You can't get an impact factor if you're not indexed. And if none of the, none of the organizations in your field have ever heard of the journal, that should be a big red flag and ringing bell. Um, you want to make sure the, the journal has a peer review process. It's got some kind of established reputation in your community. Uh, it's run or co-published by a professional society association. Those are always the best. <laughs> you know, they've been around a long time. Everyone knows them. And here are the big five. Uh, Elsevier, Springer, Wiley Blackwell, Telefrancis, and Sage Publishing. 
they publish half of everything that's academic in the world. You know if it's one of their journals. Altogether, this is probably 10,000, maybe 15,000 journals. <laughs> All disciplines, all disciplines. You can go to any one of their websites and you can trust it. You know? So altogether, this is probably close to 25,000 journals right there in all disciplines. And again, I'll send, you the, the, um, I'll send you this presentation. I'll make it freely available somehow. And uh, th this, there are two interesting articles I found on this that were very interesting reads. Also, look at your own bibliography. If you're citing that journal, it's probably, a, you know, more than twice or three times in your own work, if that's been a source for you, there's probably no better thing. And indexing is really important. So I, again, I work for, um, for um, Springer, who publishes Estuarian Coast, and they have a software called Editorial Manager. And again, Springer has got a little over 5,000 journals across all disciplines. It's published out of Germany. Um, and it doesn't matter what uh, the cover <laughs> or the banner says. In your field, it would just say something different. Otherwise, the software is exactly the same. And in fact, they even, you know, for me, uh, they, use the, they use the exact same interface whether you're an author, reviewer, editor, or the publisher themselves. So they actually just have one system that everyone in the chain is using. And, you know, you, look what it says. Log in via ORCID. <laughs> right on the front page, it's telling you, don't talk to me if you don't have an ORCID ID. You'll see what that means in the first two slides when I send them to you. And, the most important link on this page is this one. Read that first. <laughs> um, maybe you should start with about, but typically what's in the about one, that paragraph will be the first paragraph of instructions to author. And what you're looking for is, you, you want to know what the scope of the journal is, meaning what kind of stuff does it publish? Because you need to make sure that you're sending them something that'll, that meets their, their scope and is within their criteria. And the second thing is, is it'll tell you exactly what you have to do. And my biggest problem as an editor are people who don't follow the instructions. I just reject those without review right away. And then the next thing is, uh, so I, I actually was going to try and page through the whole process and show you what it looks like. After about an hour, I just gave up and said, I can't go down this rabbit hole today. <laughs> Getting back to, it's, 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 it's hard, you know, and you got to have everything done ahead of time, which is why this link is so important. And the other nice thing about Springer is they've got these tutorials now online, literally these YouTubes on how to do things. It's just, this is like less than a year old. It's just phenomenal. They also have, they don't have it here. And it's not an issue for us because most journals require you to publish in English. But they also have translation and editorial services now for all the countries in the world. I mean, it's just, and all the big houses are doing this. They're becoming literally one-stop shopping where they'll teach you how to write the manuscript, they'll teach you how to, how to go through the publication process. And if you're from China or, or somewhere else and you're, you have to publish it in English, they'll, they'll get you editorial help. I mean, it's just phenomenal that they, and, and this is why the industry is consolidating too, right? To offer all those services in one big tent, it's only coming from a few people today. <laughs> from a few different places. Oh, I'll bet you this is it. I'll bet you manuscript services is the one where, and it's a fee for service thing. You, you email them your paper and they'll make sure it's grammatically correct. And you know, estuaries and coasts right now probably 
60 percent of the manuscripts we receive are, are international ones. So they're being written by people whose first language is not English. And I would bet of those 60, I'll bet one, at least a third or a half are from China. <laughs> it's just, we're getting overwhelmed uh, with, with the international enterprise today. This is no longer a uh, Western or English-speaking world kind of activity. The whole world is starting to publish. I want to go over ethics a little bit. And I don't have, I, again, this is a whole hour lecture. And I'm just going to hit the punchlines. One is authorship. One of the biggest problems I see is people don't follow authorship guidelines. Just Google authorship guidelines, and I could, I've got a list of about 30 papers I could send you. I, I need to build a bibliography on this. At the end of the day, there are a lot of different, every journal requires one of, four, one of three or four tests, a, a significant role in planning. For example, you wrote the proposal and got the project funded. Okay, even though your student or postdoc did it, it never would have happened if you didn't lay it all out in the beginning. That's a significant role in planning. A significant role in the production of the work, you actually did it. <laughs> a significant role in writing. Those are the three criteria. You either planned it, you did it, or you wrote it. And notice every one of these is prefaced with the word significant role. And in many, it's not a problem in the US, but it's a big problem overseas. A lot of people just tack their name on the stuff because of the lab director or as some honorific. Every journal on earth has a strong prohibition against honorific authorships. In other words, you don't just put your name on something because you're the lab director or you're the department chairman or something like that or because you were on someone's committee, for example. No, you have to play significant role. How do you define significant role? Well, that's the gray area. And it's not so much of a problem here, but it's a huge problem with international uh, authorships. Some people also get themselves in a real knot over the order. I'm going to tell you right now, only one position matters, and that's the first author. That means you wrote it, and the other guys helped you. The order after that doesn't matter. There have literally been papers written where they try and build formulas and algorithms to figure out which position you should put someone in, and you should order people in their relative contributions, or the lab director goes last or something. Or, that's all crap. <laughs> at the end of the day, the citation will be Montagna et al. <laughs> so the first position is the only one that matters. I personally always list people alphabetically after the first position. That's what I, I've, I've always done. Not always. I started doing that about 10 years ago. And you know, the, the other funny thing about authorship is, again, when I was young and everything had to be done with typewriters, <laughs> that's how old I am. Um, even one co-author was unusual. It was almost always done by just one individual. You know, today, I can't, we're holding a conference next week. I've, you know, friggin' presentations or posters at a meeting and people are putting 12, 14 authors. It's like, only one person is going to stand up there and say this. Why do you even need co-authors for an oral presentation or a poster presentation? I don't even get that. But anyway, um, a lot of people tie themselves in knots over this. And I would recommend you Google you know, authorship. Science, Nature have great articles on this. Double publication is a huge problem today, a huge problem. Again, because of this predatory thing and because of the open access thing and because of the way uh, a report might get put on somebody's website 
and then you turn that you try and turn that report into you know I do this all the time. I write these hundred page final reports to sponsors, and they put them on their website. And then I want to extract part of it and make it a ten page publication. I can't do that. It's been published, even though it's not an official publication. Uh, in the context that I've been talking about predatory journals, it's still out there. It's if if Springer can find it on the web, it will not republish your work. Period. And I've had three or four cases just since January where this was a big problem. And this is where authenticate comes in. And the graduate school requires that for your thesis, right? So you guys know what that is. Believe me, it's a, I know it's a pain, but they're, they're doing you a huge favor. And the favor they're doing you is they're teaching you how to use the software <laughs> and showing you the value of it. I get let me see if I did this. Ah, I thought I had done it, but I didn't. Ah. Oh, I, I did do it. So this is what I see. I get an authenticate score for every single paper. And recently, I got one that was 85%. So I knew I wasn't going to accept it. But I went ahead and looked it up, and sure enough, it was the guy's master's thesis, and the university put it online. So that's the other important thing. You need, that means I can't publish his paper. It's already online. It's already published. And I know at the College of Science and Engineering, we have a policy that all theses and dissertations are embargoed for, it's either two or three years, meaning that the, the service that we submit these things through, can't put it online for two or three years, which gives you an opportunity to publish your work first. Okay? So that's really important. Embargo your work if you ever want to publish it. There are going to be time limits, and that's fair. That's fair to everybody. Um, <clears throat> only once did I get a score of about 30 or 40 percent, and when I looked up the paper that they were saying, hey, this is like 35% similar to what's here. The thing had practically the exact same title and the exact same abstract. I was stunned. So I rejected that and said, guy, this, this has already been done. <laughs> Just forget about it. Not every journal is using I Authenticate, but again, the big five will probably, are probably all using it today. You know, because they can afford it, and they're being more careful. So, submission is a complex process. You got to get a lot of stuff at your fingertips before you log on to that site. I've already shown you how. Go get yourself an ORCID ID first. This way, you don't have to pause in the middle of it. Uh, but the bottom line is, you're going to need to know everything about yourself, your co-authors, and you're going to probably have to have a list of three to five suggested reviewers. That means their legal name, not, not Bobby Smith, but Robert K. Smith. <laughs> okay, you gotta be careful about stuff like that. That's another thing. And you know, women have a really big problem with this because sometimes you change your names and get married. And so keeping track of names and legal names is kind of a big deal. You gotta get that right in your submission process. Most journals, most publishers, rather, will not allow you to change the names of authors once you've typed that in. And this, is, again, gets back to a plagiarism issue. <laughs> uh, Springer doesn't allow you to edit those author fields. You've got to type them in 100% correct the first time, or you have to withdraw the paper and start all over. Um, so you need their names, addresses, and emails. Get it all written down first, because you're going to have to put that in. You're going to have to get every one of them to sign a permission form to allow you to submit it. You don't actually do that. The publisher will send those emails around. Hey, someone just used your name. And this has happened to me once in my life, where I got an email from a journal that someone had submitted a paper in my name that I had had nothing to do with. Don't ask me why they chose us to do that. But I sent them back and said, no, I have nothing to do with this. There's something fake about it. And then you got to get all your files, 
you're always going to need a minimum of two files. <laughs> you have to have a separate submission letter and a separate text file. The text file sometimes has your tables and your references. Sometimes they want those different. We're back to read the instructions to authors, and it'll tell you how many files you've got to create. Every journal in the world requires one file for every figure, and they don't want the figures in the text file. Every journal in the world does that, all the big publishing houses again. Most people don't prepare figures that are ready for publication. It has to have a 300 deep dots per inch minimum, and that nearly all software will give you 75 to 150 as default, <laughs> because that's what's convenient in Word or to put on a web page. So you always got to go in and change the output or export thing to make sure you're creating something that's going to meet the resolution requirements. And you should think about, you know, the sizes and proportions. You know, you know everything's going to come out on something like this, right? This kind of page. So make sure you, and sometimes there are columns, so make sure that the, you know, width and length are proportional so that it's going to work and the, the fonts are large enough that you're going to be able to see it. Uh, and again, nine times out of ten, the default parameters won't work. You're going to have to go in there and fool with them. And like I told you, believe it or not, it can take several days. I think the fastest I've gone through one is about two or three hours. I, I did one a couple of, about a month ago. It took me nearly three days because I kept getting surprised. You want what? You want in what format? Uh, the, the, what happened to me was they wanted every figure in both color and black and white. So I had to go back and redo all my figures. <laughs> that, that was one of the surprises. And th there were some others I don't remember. So anyway, it, it's a plane. The process is remarkably complex. And there are a lot of different roles. Most of the big houses are going to have something called a managing editor. The managing editor is the guy who is um, working off the website. He's the guy who can get into, uh, this is called uh, uh, editorial manager. He, 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 he's the guy or gal who literally receives the manuscripts and then distributes them. First cut. They're just, he's like the gatekeeper. The managing editor is the gatekeeper. So the managing editor, the journal I work for, we have two, there's either one editor-in-chief or multiple. It depends on how many papers a year you process. We now process about 700 papers a year for our journal. That's too much for one person to deal with. So we have two co-editors in chief. So I handle about 300, 350 manuscripts a year, and my partner handles about 300, 350 a year. So yeah, that's like one a day, right? There's 365 days in a year. So you can see why sometimes one guy's not going to be able to handle it all. And this is what I see. And so the first thing I do is I, if, if that number's OK, I just read the paper. If this is in the 30, 40, 50 range, I click on that link and I try and figure out why is this so high. And sometimes I'll look at it and say, I don't care, it's fine, even at 30 or 40 percent. And sometimes I'll get nervous, and sometimes I'll just say, no, I'm not going to. I'm just going to go directly to the decision, and I'll say, reject without review. <laughs> um, but if I, I like it, it looks like all the parts are there, it's ready for review, then what I do is I assign it to an associate editor. The associate editor assigns it to th usually three peer reviewers. W once all the reviews are ready, he reads, he'll get an email saying the reviews are complete. And then what he does is he'll, oh, this is on a, a new one. So once reviews are com complete, there's a new thing that's a new line that says uh, read reviews, view reviews and comments. And the associate editor makes a decision, the initial decision. He sends that decision to me. And I make the final decision, and then I, I notify the author. So there are a lot of steps in the chain, <laughs> right? And 
Um, there are a lot of different things that can happen. I, I've already mentioned that if, um, if something comes in that is just wrong, either it's the biggest problem I see are incomplete manuscripts. They're literally not finished. The second problem I see is someone has just taken a report or a thesis and mailed it in as is. It's just not, they didn't follow the instructions to authors. I'll reject that without review. The third reason I reject without review is uh, it looks like it's already been published. <laughs> the fourth reason I reject without review is um, it's not appropriate for our journal. It's out of the scope. They should have never sent it to us in the first place. If it looks like an okay manuscript, I'll, tell, I'll send it to the Springer Transfer Desk and they'll find one of our 5,000 journals that look appropriate, <laughs> that are better suited for that. If it looks fishy to me, I'll just reject without review and tell them, no, it's not even ready. Uh, typically, most papers come back as revise. <laughs> In fact, every single paper that I do send out for review will come back as revise. And it's either major or minor. How, you know, that's beauties in the eye of the beholder, whether it's a major revision or a minor revision. Um, that always means it goes out, it goes back to it, one of the reviewers or the associate editor to take a second look at it. Very rarely I see, except with minor revision, that's super rare on first. Usually that's a decision of the second review. Uh, sometimes we have a paper come back two or three times. <laughs> We have a rule, we won't take a paper three times. If you can't get it right in the second revision, we're done with you, it's a reject. And then almost never on the first decision is except as is. This typically is the end of the chain. And usually there's a second revision. And I suspect this is pretty common. Those are the processes all the major publishing houses use. So again, that's what 25,000 journals in the world are doing. <laughs> The bottom line is a revision is, can, be, can be really painful. I find revisions, personally, more difficult than writing the first draft of a manuscript. Because you're trying to figure out, what do I do with these comments? And you, know, you, you can either make the suggestion, the reviewer is, is you can either accept the, accept, accept the recommendation the reviewer is making and revise accordingly, or you can rebut it. Rebuttal is a big tool, and I do rebut things. Um, sometimes they misread it, and if I think their comment is wrong, I go back and I read the thing and say, how did that guy go down the wrong trail? And sometimes I realize I need to restate this because he misunderstood what I was saying. He wasn't disagreeing with me, he just really misunderstood. So what you need to do is again create a minimum of two files, sometimes three. You need a new submission, resubmission letter and you've got to describe every single response to every comment. I personally like to do this in tables. I'll build a table in Word, and on the left column, I'll put the comment, and on the right column, my response. <laughs> and there's line numbers, so I'll tell them from line number that in the old version, you'll find the, re the fix on line number X in the new version. I find that the easiest way to do it. I seldom see other people use that approach. Most people like to just take the original files and you know, put their comment in like italics or bold or something like that. I, I don't like that approach. So you know, there's no real rule here. The only rule is you've got to provide a detailed response to every comment. That's the rule. And then, of course, you have to send the edited. Sometimes people use the word emended text. Sometimes journals want a clean version and a track change version. At my journal, we only want a clean version. I don't want to see how you got there. I just want to see what the final product is. But I'm dealing with a journal right now. They wanted a track change version. So, and then usually your graphics have to be edited. <laughs> graphics are hard to get right the first time around. Column problems. Uh, I reject things at the editor-in-chief stage 
because it's out of the scope and it didn't follow the rules. That's the most common problem. Uh, by out of scope, I mean, you know, we publish things about estuaries and someone sends me a paper about, you know, fertilizer application on a farm. <laughs> we don't, that's not what we do. <laughs> and you'd be stunned at how far afield things can come in. Um, and another thing is they just don't follow instructions. The paper is simply not ready for review. And at the associate editor stage, these are the kind of things I see a lot. They think it just lacks novelty or originality. It's, it's a mess, which means Paul probably never should have sent it to the associate editor. <laughs> I didn't read it carefully enough. I'm always embarrassed when it comes back from an AE saying, this paper's a mess. I, I should not have sent it to him in the first place. I should have done this. Lack of clarity, you'd be surprised how big a problem this is. People just can't understand what you're talking about. This is a, the biggest problem here is typically with non-native English speakers. Um, there's a fatal flaw. Um, an expert reviewer looks at it and says, wow, you did this? That's just wrong. <laughs> we, can't, we can't rely on any of the results because the methods are flawed. You can't draw those conclusions from what you, what you did. You know, the, what you did doesn't allow you to draw those conclusions. Uh, and this one, it, rides, it reads too much like a thesis dissertation or a contract, a, a final report. In other words, you didn't edit it yet. <laughs> you can almost never take something that was done for one purpose and use it for another purpose. So when you, we're back to read the instructions to authors, and you probably will have to edit what you've done. Typically, this means becoming more concise, tightening things up a bit. You know, a, a typical master's thesis in our program might have 10 or 12 or even 20 figures uh, and maybe another 10 tables. Uh, most journals won't accept more than 10 of both. <laughs> five figures, five tables. So there's, and a lot of times there's redundancy. You're trying to figure out what it means. You might present it several ways. You know, you, you never want to do that in a final result. You want to be concise. So these are the, usually when I see it rejected, that's, that's, that's what, it, what it's about. And finally, uh, things do, are successful. It can be quick, three months to two years. On average, we average about uh, four and a half months from the day we get something until the day we make a decision. And then it might take another year to put it in the queue and actually show up in print or online. We put the online versions out instantly, actually. Um, but six months to a year is probably more common. So it's going to take a while. It's an investment in time. So make sure if you're at a flux in your life, Make sure you give them an email that won't go away. That's another big problem. Someone will give me their university address and they leave the university and I can't find them. So always give backup addresses if you have a personal account. But that's something I realized was important years ago. And actually it's only been about, um, it's only been about two or three years I've got a personal email account <laughs> that I use as a backup. You know, I didn't even do that myself for a long time. Oh, I'm done. And I went a little over. Hopefully you don't mind.